Hello everyone, welcome to Summit Church Fenton Online. I'm so glad you've joined me today and I look forward to sharing the Word of God with you. I've been conducting a series over the last several weeks on the anointing and of course the anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you've missed any of the previous sessions, I'd like to invite you to go back and, you know, go back and listen to those. They're in our archives and they're there for you. They're free. Uh, go back and listen to those if you've missed any of them. You know, whenever a minister is teaching a series, uh, it's important to hear all the parts of that series. And if you just hear, you know, a couple of the parts and you don't hear the whole thing, then you miss the full message of what is, of what is coming forth. And uh, sometimes if you just listen to, you know, one or two parts of a series, it, it can really almost do you more harm than good because you can get confused if you don't hear the whole thing, you know, given in full context. So if you've missed any of the previous sessions, go back and listen to them and then pick up with this one. And uh, I, I think it'll be a blessing to you, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I don't believe that it's an accident that I'm teaching on the anointing at this time. Um, I feel that there's going to be people that's going to be listening to this, that you're in, you know, you're in serious uh, condition with your body. There's perhaps a terminal illness or, or maybe it's not a terminal illness, but it's an illness nonetheless. And it's causing you much, much discomfort and pain. But thank God for the anointing. And I know, you know, any number of people that uh, were healed by, the, by the, the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's people that I know of that should be dead right now, but they're not because they received the anointing power, the anointing of God, the power of God into their bodies, the power of the Holy Spirit. They received that power into their bodies and that power hit their bodies and healed them. And they're alive today. Thank God. Thank God for the anointing. So uh, our... our uh, uh, text that we're using, our main text is Isaiah 10, 27. Isaiah 10, 27 from the King James Version says, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So, you know, yokes of bondage, you know, yokes of bondage shall be destroyed it's talking about yokes of bondage and burdens shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The anointing of God, the power of the Holy Spirit will, will destroy burdens, will remove burdens, destroy burdens and destroy and remove yokes and break yokes of bondage that the devil has put upon you. Absolutely, the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And so we've been studying about the anointing. We're going to continue with, with that today. Uh, you know, there, there's, as you study the Bible, there's an anointing that, that can come on people, uh, come on ministers to minister to people. or You know, and you don't have to be a minister, a, 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 a five-fold minister. What I mean by that is an apostle, a, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. You don't have to be a five-fold, what's known as a five-fold minister, you know, called to a pulpit ministry to, to have the anointing come upon you. Uh, certainly the anointing comes upon the five-fold minister, certainly. But, but it, it, you don't have to stand in a pulpit and have a, ha, you know, be a five, what's known as a, a five-fold minister uh, to have the anointing come on you. And uh, so you need to realize that. But there's an anointing that can come upon, the power of the Holy Spirit can come upon. And we've been studying about that the last several weeks. And then there's an anointing within that I believe we're going to get to that. I believe we're going to get to that next week. Uh, the anointing within. And thank God for the anointing within, but, you know, within the believer, within the, the, the heart of the believer, well, you know, the, the believer upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll get to that next week, but it just, it seems like today, before I get to the anointing within, next week, I want to talk today about the tangible anointing, the tangible anointing, you know, an anointing that, that can come upon someone and it's tangible. You can sense it. You can, you can feel it. And I've said some things about about this already, certainly like in the ministry of Jesus. Remember when the woman with the issue of blood touched him in faith, he felt power go out of him. And uh, now I, I don't know if she felt the power 
She may have, she may not have, but she certainly felt the effects of it. And, and her faith drew that power out of him. He felt the power leave him. It flowed out of his body through, the, through his, his garment into the hem of his garment. She touched the hem or the wing of his garment. And she may or may not have felt the power, but she sure felt the effects of it. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague of that, of that issue of blood. Uh, but, but, you know, there's times you can, can certainly sense the anointing. And uh, I've talked to you er earlier in, in these sessions about how I've sensed the anointing of God and how, I, you know, you can sense it, you know, sometimes very heavily upon uh, a worship music, you know, and, uh, and certainly on the teaching of the word of God. And, and when God, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, like in, in like in a church service, don't have to be a church service, could be just any time where, where you know, the, the, the uh, God, I, for lack of a better way to say it, he just, you know, turns up the volume, so to speak, on the anointing. And you, I tell you what, you can, you can, sense, you can sense it. And uh, sometimes I'll start crying. Sometimes, sometimes I'll, you know, get real bold, you know. It, you know, it just it just depends on uh, on the situation. But uh, but the anointing, the, you know, now you don't have to feel the anointing. You don't have to feel it, uh, you know, because like I said, I've laid hands on hundreds and multitudes, probably into the thousands and thousands of people. And most of the time I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel what does the anointing feel like? Well, it feels like electricity or it feels like heat. Remember. Uh, the anointing is to the spiritual realm what electricity is to the natural realm. But most of the time I laid hands on people, I didn't feel, I didn't feel that electricity or, or the heat, if you will. <laughs> and, and most all the time, the people I laid hands on didn't feel the, the, the uh, you know, electricity or heat, didn't feel it. But the power flowed nonetheless. You know, that's where faith comes in. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not perceived with the five physical senses. Most of the time, the people that I laid hands on didn't feel because I talked to them. The people that got healed, multitudes of people healed. Not everybody got healed, but multitudes did. And, uh, and I talked to them, and some of them, you know, a, a small number said they felt like heat or electricity go into their body when we laid hands upon them. You know, when I laid hands on them, but most of them didn't feel anything. I didn't feel, I didn't feel anything. They didn't feel anything. We just believed the word of God, praise God, and they got healed. But there were times where people felt that tangible anointing. I, uh, and I've shared some instances with you where, in earlier sessions where I felt the, uh, the tangible anointing of the spirit of God. And uh, uh, it, it feels like electricity. It feels like heat. And if you missed, again, the previous sessions, go back and listen. I think it'll be helpful to you and very interesting on top of it. But let's talk, uh, let, let's center in a little bit more here today on the tangible anointing. Uh, what does the anointing do? It destroys yokes and bondages. It heals sickness and disease. It drives out sickness and disease. It drives out the power of the devil. It drives demons out. It brings blessing. Glory to God. But let's look at 1 Kings, the 8th chapter and the 4th verse. This was at the completion of uh, Solomon's temple, 1 Kings 8, 4. 1 Kings 8, verse 4. Then they brought up the Ark of the Lord. Now, this is the Ark of the Covenant. And that, that, that Ark represented, and can, it represented the presence of God, the anointing of God, it contained the presence of God. It contained the anointing of God. The, what is the anointing? The power of the Holy Spirit. And they brought the ark, uh, and they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, um, and they, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. So you know, the the table of showbread and the candlestick and and and, and all those articles of the temple. That's a whole study in and of itself. But the Ark of the Lord, that's where we're, we have the focus here today. The priests and the Levites uh, brought them up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him uh, uh, were with him before the Ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitudes. There was a lot of, a lot, lot of animals being sacrificed. Then the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, of the Lord to its place. This is at the dedication of, of Solomon's temple. 
And so the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant. That represents the, the presence of God, the, the anointing of God, the power of God to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple uh, to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the Ark and the cherubim overshadowed the Ark uh, and its poles. And again, the Ark was supposed to be handled in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way. There was a prescribed way to handle it. It had to be handled by the priests. It had to be carried on poles. And remember that because of where, what I'm going to say here in a little while. The Ark was holy. The anointing is holy. The presence of God is holy. It had to be handled appropriately and properly as prescribed by the Lord. Verse 8, the poles extended uh, so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside, and they are there to this day. Nothing uh, was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, now listen to this, Talking about the tangible anointing of God. Tangible means, uh, you know, you could, you could feel it. Listen, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering. Now, here you have a situation. Now, let's read this. So that the priest could not continue ministering. Actually, King James says they could not stand to minister. Uh, some versions, Bible versions, say they were not able to stand. And we're talking stand bodily. They, they couldn't stand up bodily. They fell. They fell down. They couldn't continue to stand. They fell. Why? Because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Now this glory of the Lord, this cloud, this glory, is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the anointing, the power of God was manifested in this cloud and it was glory and it was, it was turned up, I mean, turned up at full bore, you know, way up. It was in great manifestation, let's put it that way. Because the anointing can be in greater manifestation or less manifestation. But here, this is one time it was turned way up. And it was, it was so powerful that the priests could not continue in their ministry. They couldn't, they couldn't stand to minister. They were not able. It actually means they were not able to stand up on their feet. They fell. We could put it this way. They fell under the power of that, uh, of that anointing. They fell under the power of that anointing. They, they, you know, they, they must have, uh, they, they must have, have felt, certainly felt that power and that power just flat knocked them, knocked them down. They could not stand to minister. Talking about the tangible anointing. Now, there's another instance I want to show you in, in, uh, in, in John's uh, gospel account. Let's go to John 18, verse 1. This was when Jesus was about to be arrested. He was actually being arrested, about to be arrested, to be taken, you know, uh, before he was taken to the cross. In John 18, verse 1, but those priests at the dedication of Solomon's temple, they couldn't stand because that, that power, that anointing was so strong, they fell. Couldn't continue with their ministry. They fell down. Uh, now in John 18, verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciple over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, uh, which he and his disciples entered. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Uh, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to, said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. Or I am he, but actually, I am. He said, I am. And he is. I, he's the great I am. And he said, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am, or I am he, 
notice what happened. This often gets overlooked. They drew back and fell to the ground. Now we're talking a large number of, 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 of officers and, 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 and officials and whatnot come out with weapons. They're there with all their weapons and lanterns and torches. And I mean, they're out there in full force. There wasn't just a few. There was a, quite a large number of, of, uh, of you know, the officials coming to arrest Jesus. And he says, when he says, I am, he actually said, I am. And when he said that, they drew back and they fell to the ground. What happened there? Well, I think it's clear. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit, no doubt hit these, hit, hit this large group of people and just, I mean, just knocked them backward, just leveled them backward. <laughs> Glory to God. And then Jesus asked him again, whom are you seeking? Now, I think that that's, I mean, if you think about that, just think about that. I mean, they came to take him and, and he said, he, he, he said, I am. And when he said, I am, the power of God hits them and knocks them down. And they're laying there helpless before the Lord. You know, the Bible said, and Je well, Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. They couldn't have taken him. They were, they'd fallen back under the power of the Spirit of God. They, they weren't going to take him unless he wanted to go. He said, no man, Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. He said, I lay it down and I take it up again. <laughs> they couldn't have taken him. Why? Because they had the power of God, the anointing, the tangible anointing of God hit, hit, that, hit that group of officers and knocked them flat. I mean, there was a lot of them there too. I mean, there was a bunch of them and they just knocked them flat. Fell, fall, they, fell, they fell under the power of the anointing tangible anointing it must have been tangible i mean because down they went and uh and so there you see it in the ministry of jesus and then if you go over to acts the 10th chapter and the ninth verse this one this was when peter was up on the rooftop praying before he went over and preached the gospel to the gentiles at cornelius's house in acts 10 verse 9 the next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now, so he's up there praying because they're coming from Cornelius's house to get him to go over and preach the gospel to the, to the Gentiles over at Cornelius's house. And before that happened, God was getting Peter ready. He's going to give him a vision here. But notice he, he's up on the housetop praying and uh, about the sixth hour. So I guess that, what would that be at noon? And he became very hungry. Well, it was, it was lunchtime and he wanted to eat. But while they made ready, while they were getting lunch ready, the Bible says he fell into a trance. He fell into a trance. Now that look, that word fell up in the Greek. Yeah. It, it, I mean, yeah, he fell into a trance. It actually means he fell over bodily. Now he had a vision, but if you, if you study that word fell, it, 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 it actually can mean and there, there's a meaning there that he actually fell over bodily what happened that the the anointing of the spirit of god came on him no doubt the power of god hit him and he fell over bodily and he went into a trance now when you hear that word trance a lot of times people think demonic and certainly you know over in the the, the dark side over in the demonic world trances and and that's all evil stuff but there is over here on the on the good side, over here on God's side, there, people can fall into a trance. I mean, it's, a, it's right there in the Bible. The apostle Peter fell into a trance. The, the anointing of God, no doubt, he's up there praying. The power of God came on him and he fell into a trance. He fell over, actually fell over bodily and, and fell into a trance, which would just mean a, 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 it's like a spiritual state that he went into. Some sort of a spiritual state where he was uh, in a trance. Just look that up, do a little study on it. He, he fell into a trance. He was overcome by the, the, the Spirit of God. 
And while he was in that trance, he saw heaven, verse 11, he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him, let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals, wild beasts, creeping things, and so forth. And, you know, then, then the, the voice came to him, the voice of the Lord, no doubt, said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And it was about what that had to do with is, is because the Jews thought that the Gentiles were unclean and they, they, weren't, they thought they weren't worthy of the gospel. But God was telling Peter through this vision of the, the animals that the, that the Gentiles are worthy of the gospel. You know, they, they need to hear the gospel and, that, and, and Peter needs to go and preach the gospel. And, and we could talk for hours on that. But the point I'm trying to get at here, and, and he did go preach to the Gentiles and, and Cornelius and his house and they believed, praise God, got, and got saved. And that's wonderful. But the point here of this message is we're talking about the tangible anointing. No doubt that that anointing came on Peter. He no doubt must have felt it because he fell over bodily and, and had, went into this trance and had a vision. And, and then if you look at Acts, the 22nd chapter, I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time. But if you go to Acts, the 22nd chapter, the Apostle Paul, he fell into a trance on one occasion. It's not an evil thing. Now it can be an evil thing over in the, you know, over in the if you're if you're following over after the devil and his cohorts. But 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 you can get into a place of prayer, a time where you know you're before the Lord, and 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 we have Peter and Paul. They both fell into a trance, and 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 we know that from studying that Greek Greek word fell here on Peter that he fell over bodily, and and, and he he went into a trance, had a vision. It was a holy thing. And so these things are real. The anointing is real. I'm trying to get through to you that the anointing is real. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it's tangible. Like I told you a few minutes ago, but it's worthy of repetition. I've laid hands on multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of people over the last 40 years. And most of the time, I didn't feel anything and neither did the people I laid hands on. Remember, Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. And then one of the signs is they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And so we've laid hands on multitudes of people, thousands and thousands of them. And most of the time, I didn't feel anything, uh, any, any electrical power, electrical like power or heat. And the people I laid hands on that were healed, and not all of them got healed, but multitudes did. And uh, in talking to many of them, they didn't feel any power, but they felt the effects of it. Like the woman with the issue of blood, they, they felt in their bodies, either some of them instantly, most of them recovered over time, but they'd come back at a later time and testify that they were healed. And they didn't feel any electrical power flowing or they didn't, didn't uh, uh, feel heat or whatever, but they felt the effects of it. Uh, they were healed. But sometimes, once in a while, it would be tangible and you, and you could feel it. Like I had told you in a previous session, um, one time I was laying hands on the sick and my assistant, a faithful assistant, his first name was Ryan. And he was working behind me, just, just there with me, assisting me, standing behind me. And, and people would be out here and be laying hands on him. The ushers would be there. And, and one time he told me, he, Ryan told me, he said that he, he, he had a hold of my jacket. Remember, we taught you that the, the anointing can flow through cloth. And uh, we'd start praying for the people. The anointing of God would be there. And, and uh, one time he said he had a hold of my suit coat and he, 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 had to, he had to pull his hand off of it. He said it got so hot. It got hot. He had, it didn't burn him, but it felt like, you know, he said almost like you put your hand on a stove. But yet I didn't, but yet I didn't feel anything. It's interesting how that works. There's times that I'd feel, you know, occasionally I'd feel the power of God and, and, like, and he wouldn't or other people wouldn't. It's interesting how, I don't know how all it works, but thank God it does. And glory to God. I'm just trying to stir your faith that the, the anointing is real. It's, it's real. But, you know, Peter fell into a trance. Paul fall into, fell into a trance. And you know what? I'm thinking of one right now. There's a lady, I believe it was back in the, in the early 1900s. I believe it was when the World Fair was in, in the St. Louis, uh, Missouri area. And this lady's name was uh, Maria Woodworth Etter. And she was a, a holy woman of God, a Pentecostal lady, if I'm not mistaken. A holy woman of God. And, uh, and I know she was, she was ministering down, down in, in the St. Louis area 
and they were having the world's fair at the time and she was up uh, preaching and, 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 and they ran the, the uh, story of this in the, in the St. Louis newspaper. I believe they had a picture of her there, but, uh, but she was up preaching and just as she was going to make a point, she, she just fell into a trance and, and she, she, her body, the, the anointing of the spirit of God came on her and she just, you know, however she was when she was making that point, she just froze there. She froze and she stood there for, I think, several days, Did, didn't eat, didn't drink, didn't move. I mean, it, it, it was a power of God. And how, I mean, I'd have trouble standing like this for five minutes without moving. She stood frozen for several days, however long it was. It'd do you good to go look that story up and study it out and check me out and, and do some research on it. But she and Maria Woodworth Edder, right here in St. Louis, back in the early 1900s, during the time of the World's Fair, she fell into a trance while preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and multitudes of people walked by and filed by. You know, I guess they came over from the fair. They'd heard that had happened and they came over and they, and they walked by and they watched this. They looked at this holy woman of God. She was frozen in a, in a trance. Absolutely. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, when she came out of that trance, she picked up her message right where she left off. Glory to God. These things are real. They're real. And I'm teaching you today about the tangible anointing just to, again, just to stir your faith that, that this, this is real. And you don't have to feel the anointing to feel the effects of it. But thank God, sometimes you can feel the anointing. And, and uh, I know in, in, in my life, I remember... Uh, Again, ministering for now, well, 30 years in the pastorate and being around the ministry some 8 to 10 years before that. So I guess 35, 40 years, however you want to add it up, you know, I ministered to a whole lot of people. Most of the time I didn't tangibly feel the anointing, but so many times we would see the effects of it, the good effects of it. Praise God. But sometimes, occasionally, You'd feel it. I remember the first time I felt it, and I shared this in a previous session, was when I was a 19-year-old boy and I went to this certain uh, uh, church and the man's name was David Crank Sr., a man of God, a prophet of God. And, and I went there and I was sick when I, you know, I had been sick that whole day with a fever. And, and I won't go through the whole story again. I went through it in le at length in a, in a previous session. And you can go listen to that if you'd like, but uh, I know uh, he, he shared some things with me by the Spirit of God, and, and I, felt, I felt like an electrical net, like, a, like somebody had thrown a net or, a, or like a cloth or something electrical on my head. It was like electricity, and, and that stayed there for a time, for, I don't know, a couple of minutes, and, and eventually I was looking down. When I look up, I, that, that, that electrical power, that anointing was there, and uh, I looked up first time, it, it was there, because I had my head down, he was, he was prophesying to me. Looked up the second time it was there, and, and he's talking about some things concerning the calling of God and the ministry and whatnot. I'm 19 years old, I was raised in a Baptist church. We didn't have these things in a Baptist church. You know why you don't have these things in a Baptist church? Because the Baptists, by and large, believe that, that they've all passed away. But they haven't passed away. Nothing against the Baptists. I love the Baptists, I'm still kind of a Baptist at heart. I got saved in a Baptist church, but, but there was something missing in the Baptist church. And I didn't know what it was for years and years. It was just an emptiness. Thank God I got saved. A Baptist get a lot of people saved, but I come to find out that, that they didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And they didn't believe in, this, in the supernatural move of the Spirit of God. And, and, and so I came, I, I, I you know, uh, respectfully moved out of the Baptist church and came over into the charismatic church where they believed, glory to God, in the moving of the Spirit of God. And, and, uh, and, and we need to be around those of like faith. And the, the moving of the Spirit of God is real. Again, thank God for the Baptists. They get probably more people saved than anybody else. But, but we, we also need to realize the Bible teaches the moving of the Spirit of God. So anyway, I'm in this, in this church as a 19-year-old boy and, and this prophet, he really was a prophet. And for me to say that, because most times you, somebody says they're a prophet or, you know, so much 
there's so much fake that you see on television and whatnot. People call themselves prophets, but they're not. But this man, David Crank Sr., he senior, he's in heaven now. He was a prophet. Now he was. And, and but I'm 19 years old and, and I was sick all day. I'm there in his meeting that night, several hundred people in the room. He calls me out of the crowd. I'm like, what's going on here? And but he's shared some things with me about the the call of God, the ministry and and whatnot. And and that, that God would show himself strong to me, and, and he has and continues to, and glory to God, the hand of the Lord would be on me, and, and just, just go, the anoint, thank God for the anointing, the hand of the Lord, the anointing of, of God, and, and, and other things, and it was what a blessing, but I had been sick all day, and that fever was there, but I, I had my head down while he's prophesying, I looked up, there's a power, like electrical charge there, like electrical power, looked down, looked up the second time, that power still there. Looked up the third time, the power still there. Looked down, looked up the fourth time, that power, that electrical power was gone, but so was the, the, the fever. <laughs> Glory to God. Can you say amen? And then, so I shared that with you in an earlier session, but another experience I had uh, was I was, uh, uh, I mean, that, that startled me so badly. <laughs> I, didn't go, I didn't go back there for a while because I, I had to think through that. But, but sometime later, I don't know, about a year or so later, I went, I went back there and uh, I remember uh, it was an evening, an evening service. And uh, after the, the service was over, uh, Brother Crank was up on, on the platform. This was before he was in his bigger building. And he had his ushers up around the, the front of the stage there. He was, he was, a, he, was a, uh, he, he kept his distance from people and, and, and all of that. But uh, I remember I was, I guess I was about uh, 20, 20 years old, 21 years old at the time. And I wanted to just, I wanted to talk, talk to him just, just briefly. And I remember the ushers weren't going to let me through. And, and Brother Crank looked, looked back my way and I just motioned my hand. And if I could just have a moment of his time. And I remember he, he came up, he pushed the ushers aside and he, he, he and, you know, he didn't, he didn't know who I was, but he, all I remember is he grabbed me. He had some big hands. He grabbed me on one, you know, I'm 20, what, 20, 21 years old. He grabs me, he says, down on your knees, down on your knees. And I go down on my knees and uh, he prays for me and shares some things with me. And, and uh, I won't get into that, uh, but, uh, but he shares some things with, and when he gets done, he prayed for a couple of minutes. I don't know. Oh, the power of God was so strong, but here's what I'm trying to get at. I tried to get up and I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, because he, he got done ministering to me and he, he left, you know, he left and went, went, went out of the auditorium, but I'm there and there's people all over the place still, you know, the service had been dismissed, but there was dismissed, but there was still a lot of people there. But I'm down on my I'm down on my hands and my knees, and I'm trying to get up and I can't. I said I'm trying to get up and I can't. The power of God was so strong that that I I couldn't get up. I tried to get up and I couldn't get up. <laughs> I, I tried, and, and so it took me. Now I know this might sound strange to you, but I'm just telling you what happened. The power of God was so strong. I tried to get up. But I, 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 I couldn't get up. And about five minutes came and went, and I was finally able, that power lifted, and I was able to get up and, and leave the service. And I remember the things he told me there. I remember them to this day, and, 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 and uh, praise God. But some years then, many years came and went. So I'm like 20 years old at the time, and I guess about 15 years comes and goes. These things didn't happen all the time. But I remember, I say 15 years, let's see, 50, I was 20, so yeah, probably 15 years. I'm about 35 at the time, I don't know, 35, 40 years old, however many years come and go. And one time there at Summit Church when we were on location, I remember I walked up into the pulpit, this very behind this very podium right here, and uh, I don't know, there's, there's, I don't know, 150, 180 people there. And uh, I walked into the pulpit and we're talking about the tangible anointing. And uh, I, I got in the pulpit and, uh, <laughs> and now listen, hear me out on this. And, and, and I got stuck behind the pulpit. 
What do you mean you got stuck? I could talk, I could move, but I couldn't move my feet. Now, normally when I'm preaching and teaching, I move, you know, when there's, when there's a congregation, I'll move around, I'll walk over there, walk over here. I move out from behind the pulpit here. I can't because of the, of the camera have to stay stationary here, but my feet got stuck. I, I couldn't move. And so long story short, I preached my message and, uh, and I made the altar call. I dismissed the service and people were leaving and whatnot. But uh, a good number of people stayed. And normally I would greet at the door. <laughs> but I couldn't I couldn't move. I was stuck behind the pulpit, couldn't move. And normally I greet at the door. And so a lot of the people, since I couldn't go to the door, they came up and I, they, they greeted me behind the pulpit. So that was different. But I couldn't move. And so, I don't know, there's about 180 people there that day. And I guess after I dismissed, there's probably, I don't know, about 50 of them stayed around. I guess some of them wanted to see what was going to happen. I couldn't move. So I'm wondering what's going on here. So I'm, and so uh, uh, I remember I looked off to my left and there was a, there was a, a young, a young uh, lady over here to my left and, and, and the word of the Lord came to me right on the inside and, and had me call her up. I called her up. Uh, up to, she stood right side of me and the Lord gave me a word for her, something she needed to hear. I shared it with her and I mean something broke in her, something broke in her and, 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 and she had been bound by some things and the word that the Lord gave me for her instantly uh, helped her, set her free from some stuff. Glory to God. And as soon as I shared that word with her, my feet were loosed and I was able to go. Glory to God. Now you see, why would that, why would that happen? Well, if I'd have went about my normal routine that day, uh, and that hadn't happened, I probably, that I, I could assure you that girl, that, that young lady wouldn't have got ministered to, and she really needed to hear what the spirit of God had to say to her through me. But, but had I been going about my normal routine, that would have, that would have got bypassed. And so that day, I mean, God loved that woman so much. He wanted to get that word through to her and she needed it. There's no telling what would have happened to her if, if she hadn't got set free right there. But see, I got stuck in the pulpit until I, until I get, did what God wanted me to do. And then I was free to go. <laughs> Praise God. Glory to God. I remember another time there was a lady in our service that, that uh, she, uh, we were ministering. This was on a Wednesday night. And the power of God, the anointing of God came on her and knocked her down. I mean, just, just, just knocked her down. And she laid on the floor for quite some time under the power of the Spirit of God. And uh, I remember I went back in my office and this is about 30 minutes after I dismissed the service. The people just didn't want to leave that night. You know, you get around the anointing, you don't want to leave it. There's something about it. And, uh, and so finally, I could tell back in my office that the people, you know, it didn't seem like anybody was leaving. And uh, maybe a few people had left, but, but I looked out and, and, and I looked up towards the, the platform and the lady, you, you know, I could see she was still laying under the power of God. And, and when I went up there, I, I, I mean, I... There were, there were a couple of people that tried to walk up nearer and the power of God hit them and knocked them down. And then this one lady, I remember she went up and tried to touch this lady. I don't know why she's the lady that was laying down. This, this one lady, she went up and, and went to touch this lady and, and take her by the feet. And the power, I'll never forget the power of God didn't hurt nobody. The power, the power of God, I'm talking about the power of God hit this lady when she went to touch the lady that was laying under the power. This other lady went to like touch her feet. Now I'll never forget. And the power of God hit that woman and just hit her, rolled her across the floor. <laughs> well, I just don't believe that happened, Pastor Terry. Well, that's, that's your prerogative. Well, this sounds demonic to me. No, it's not demonic. It's a flow of the Spirit of God. Now there are demonic things, all right, but the Holy Spirit will flow. And uh, the tan and, and, and and, and the tangible anointing is real. And, and anyway, I asked that lady who, she was like stuck to the floor there. And then finally, because I watched, she tried to get up. She couldn't, but finally she got up and a holy woman of God, and I talked to her afterwards. She said that there were some bondages that were on the inside of her that the devil had bound her with. You know, that, 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 that some things that, that, that the devil had bound her with. That is some, some, some things she was dealing with internally. 
And she said that the anointing of God, by the time she was able to get up, because I watched her try to get up, the power of God had her there. And, uh, and, and when she got up, she was totally free, totally free, totally free. Can you say amen? Glory to God. Yeah, there is a, a demonic side. We don't fool with that. We don't run with the devil. We run with the Holy Ghost. And I tell you what, you run with God, you'll see some interesting things. You, you really, really, really will. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, it, now if, you, if you're a, a, like in the, come out of the Catholic Church or the Baptist Church or the Methodist or Lutheran or whatnot, you may not, <laughs> this may strike you as strange, but if you run among the Pentecostals or the Charismatics, we believe in the power of God. And again, these things don't happen all the time, <laughs> you know, very rarely, but they, they do happen. I'm sharing this with you, at the, with you at the direction of the Lord to stir your faith that these things are real. Now, I know like when it comes to laying on of hands, a lot of times you'll see around charismatic Pentecostal circles, people lay hands on uh, you know, ministers. A lot of times will lay hands on people. You see people fall down. Now, I want to tell you that about 90 plus percent of that is not the power of God. When people, you see ministers lay hands on people and they fall down, about 90 percent plus of that isn't the power of God. When people fall, that most of that, about 90 percent plus is just learned behavior. Okay, and I know people get mad at me when I say that, but but it's just learned behavior. <laughs> when you see a minister lay hands on somebody and they fall, a lot of that is just people that it's just learned behavior. And, that, and, and this falling, quote unquote, now I believe in falling under the power, but just falling to be fallen, I, I, I think that has done a great disservice to, to the uh, to, to the to the uh, to the kingdom of God, because see what happens is people think that well, if if they if hands are laid on them and they fall, well then they're more spiritual or that that they're going to get healed. And I've watched people fall, you know, when I laid hands on them and it wasn't the power of God; they just fell because it's a learned behavior and they didn't get anything. And but but it's it, it, people think well if I fall if, if somebody falls under the power well if you fall under the power it's, it's, it's it, it, there's something to it but but you see ministers lay hands on people and they fall down and and, and you get to thinking well if they fall they must have got something I've watched I've watched hundreds of people fall and not get anything and I've watched hundreds of people not fall and get healed so you, you see but what happens is you get your mind on the falling you know and it's unfortunate it's a disservice it's sad when emphasis is put on that and you know one way to correct it and i've said this for years is just take away the catchers take away the ushers the people that stand behind the just take them away and it will it will take all the fakery out of it because, because if there's no catchers back there if somebody's going to fall you know it's gonna it's gonna be the power of God, I assure you. And I'll tell you right now, if somebody falls under the power of God, they won't get hurt. They won't get hurt. I remember this one guy. His name was D. He's in heaven now. He's a big guy. Looked like Paul Bunyan, big guy. And the and, and uh, I, I know the the I I went to lay hands on him. And I remember, and when I laid hands on people, I barely touched people. Have you ever seen ministers, they grab people and they try to get them to fall and they'll push them. And that is so sad. That, that's such a, does, that is just, that's, that's, a, that, that's a cancer on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the things of God, if you will. It, 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 it's, it's sad when that happens. I've watched ministers try to push people down and they won't leave somebody until they push them down. They fall on the ground. That's so sad. I remember D, I just... I remember I just barely got my hands up in front of it. Now I'm nothing. Get your hands off me. Uh, get your eyes off me. But think about the power of God. I just barely, just barely touched him. I mean, the power of God hit him. And it's like somebody hit him in the head with a baseball bat. And there were catchers there, but they didn't do any good. D was so big, he wiped out the catchers in the whole front row. <laughs> but, but he came up for healing and he got up healed. Can you say Amen. And I remember one lady, she was standing in a healing line and I laid hands on her and I moved on. The ushers moved with me. And all of a sudden I look off to my right because I saw her there and it looked like she was about to fall. And she fell and she went back and she hit her head on the, I mean, her head, I'm just telling you, her head hit on the, on the, it was a cement floor, but it had a carpet on it, but the carpet didn't, wasn't much cushion. And I thought, oh my gosh, this woman's, she's going to have to go to the hospital. But see, she fell under the power of God. You fall under the power. Power of God, you won't get hurt. She fell under the power of God. There was no catchers there. 
The ushers tried to get over there in time. They didn't make it. She went back, and I mean, her head hit the floor. It sounded like a watermelon hitting, hitting if you threw a watermelon down on, on cement. I tell you what, she got up. She wasn't hurt. She was healed of whatever it is she came up in the line to get. Can you say amen? Glory to God. So these things are real. One time there was a guy that had a back injury. He'd got injured in, in high school playing football, I believe it was. His back was injured. And uh, he came up in the line, the healing line. And uh, I remember I stood in front of him and, and just the power of God, the anointing came on me. And, uh, and I, just, I just danced a little jig in front of him. I didn't even know what was wrong with him. The power of God hit this man and just leveled him. Just down he went. He got up. Oh, I don't know, several minutes later, long story short, he, he was totally healed of that, of, that, of that back injury. Glory to God. And he said he felt the power of God, uh, uh, he, he said he felt the power of God hit him. I remember I laid hands on a certain uh, uh, fellow one time, and this didn't happen all, these are just some isolated incidents that happened over the many years. This didn't happen all the time. I'm just giving you the highlights. If you just listen to this sermon, you're going to think this happened all the time. No, these are the highlights of, of some 30 plus years of ministry. I laid hands on this one guy and I felt the power go out of me into him. And you know, he took, how do you take hold of the power of God? By faith, by believing it. He, and I laid hands on him. I felt like, like power go out of me into him. And then he released it. How do you really, he started to doubt. And just as he started to doubt, this happened one time in all these years, that power came out of him, hit me, and just leveled me. Just, and there were no catchers behind me. I, it just knocked me flat down. <laughs> and and I, it startled me. It just knocked me down. So I got back up, and I said, well, let's do this again. And I taught him. I said, now this time we're going to lay hands on you again. This time, you know, believe, but don't, don't doubt. And I laid hands on him. I felt that power go into him and it hit him. I mean, it just leveled him. And I'd laid hands on other people, other people there. They didn't fall, but the anointing, see God turned the anointing up. I, I don't know why he does. I don't know. You have to ask him. But this guy, the power, he drew it into him. The power got hit him. It leveled him down and he got up healed. Can you say amen? Glory to God. I remember one time uh, there was a lady came in the prayer line. It was a visitor. I didn't know her. And uh, I had no, I didn't know she looked, she, you could tell in the natural there was something not right with her, but there were, I don't know, there was a lot of people in the prayer line that day. And as I got up to her, stepped in front of her, she started growling. I mean, it was, it was scary. It was like, it was, it was a supernatural, it was demonic. And I tell you what, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. My ushers told me later the hair stood up on the back of their neck. And, uh, and this lady standing in front of me growling. Now this happened, this is one incident here. This didn't happen all the time. And, and so I, 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 just, I just said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the head of the church, I said, you demonic power. I said, come out of her. And I, just as I touched her, I mean, the power of God hit this woman and didn't knock her backwards. It melted her straight down. She goes straight down and I see in the spirit, I see what looked like a black bird or a bat go out to my left. It didn't say nothing to anybody because people think you're crazy. You talk about this kind of stuff to people, they'll start thinking you're crazy. And I'm even a little hesitant to share this stuff with you. I normally don't. But I'm doing this at the direction of the Spirit of God because He wants to stir some people's faith. Some people face in terminal illness. You need this power. You do. And so that's why He has me sharing on it. But I saw what looked like a black bat go off to my left. Now, I didn't say anything to anybody. This lady, long story short, she finally, she gets up off the floor. She's instantly delivered. The whole, her whole demeanor is different. Glory to God. Totally delivered. I'm standing at the door after that service greeting in this, this high school math teacher. She was a math teacher at Eureka High School. Very sound lady. She comes up to me and she's 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 like Pastor Terry. Can, 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 I, can I talk to you? And I said certainly. What what is it? And she said you're gonna think I'm crazy probably, but I gotta I gotta tell you something. She said when you laid hands on that woman, she said I saw what looked like two black birds or bats fly off out of her and went out to her right, but see it would have been my left. She said, do you think I'm crazy? I said no. I'm glad to hear you say it because I know I'm not crazy. I saw the same thing. I saw one go out. She saw two. There must have been two of them. I saw one, but thank God those demonic, those demon spirits left. Glory to God, that woman was delivered. Can you say amen? Somebody said, well, we don't ever have things happening like that at our church. Well, maybe you're in the wrong church. Huh? <laughs> I said, I mean, maybe you're in the wrong church. You don't ever have people healed at your church? 
We had, I'm not saying this boastfully, but we had multitudes of people healed over, over 27 years. You're not having people healed by the power of God and the, and the sick aren't being prayed for. And uh, Come on. I mean, there's a lot of churches, they want to believe in these things, but oh, you ever have them start happening? <laughs> That's a different thing. A lot of people, you know, they, they'll say they believe, a lot of churches will say they believe in the power of God, but don't ever have it. Don't you want to go to, the, to a church that believes in it and then has it? These things didn't happen all the time. You know, if you got this kind of stuff going, well, I tell you what, let me put it this way. If the Spirit of God's in it, you won't have this kind of stuff going on all the time. I'm giving you the highlights of all these years. I remember my wife one time, I, the Spirit of God had me, had, had me call her up to minister to, to the sick. I remember my wife now, she came up and she began to pray for the sick. And that particular day, the power of God came on her. You can ask her, she couldn't stand, bodily, she couldn't stand up. The power of God was so strong on her, the ushers had to hold her up as she went down the line and pray, praying for people. You ask my wife sometimes, she'll tell you these things are very real. Praise God. I want to tell you one other story. I remember there was a man in my church. He's very near and dear to my heart, but he would see the anointing of God come on me over the years. And I'd begin to cry and weep. Sometimes that's what happens to me. And, and one time he told me privately, he said, you know, and he kind of made fun of me. He said, he said, you know, not disrespectfully fun, but fun of me. He said, oh, that crying. He said, ah, he said, that's, that's not the Holy Spirit. He said, that's just you being emotional. <laughs> well, I guess I am emotional, but I sometimes when the Spirit of God comes on me, I start crying. So he had said that to me. I don't know, I, several months later, he was, he was ushering at the door in the back and I was standing in the front. The Spirit of God directed me right on the inside to go back. I walked back to him. All the people turn around as I walk back to him, not to embarrass him, but the Spirit of God just wanted me to grab him by the hand. I grabbed him by the hands and when I did, he was just standing there just, and this is not an emotional man. The power of God came on him and we stood there for over five, probably about seven minutes and he cried like a baby. The power of God came on him and he cried like a baby. Just cried. <laughs> he never made fun of me anymore after that. Hey, the power of God is real. Now, in the time I have left, I want to just say to you that the, uh, the anointing doesn't always bring healing. Uh, if you look at Acts, the 13th chapter, the Apostle Paul, he and Barnabas, if I'm not mistaken, they had gone out on their first missionary journey and they were opposed by a false prophet, actually a sorcerer, a representative of the devil. And for the sake of time, if you look at Acts 13, verse 11, um, well, actually, verse 9, Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked at him intently, looked at this, this sorcerer, this false prophet, looked at him intently. And you can read Acts 13, the first several verses there, and, and, and see this for sake of time. But this, this, this false prophet is opposing Paul, and he looks at him intently and says, Oh, full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, Paul saying this to this, this false prophet, you enemy of all righteousness, you, uh, it says, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is on you. It's the hand of the Lord. It's the power of God. The anointing of God is upon you, and you shall be blind and not see the sun for a time. Now you think about that. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and this false prophet, dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Isn't that something? The power of God is real. And, and, and by the way, it must not be mishandled. It's like electricity. Remember, electricity is to the natural realm, like the anointing is to the spiritual realm. Electricity, I mean, you, you need to realize that if you mishandle electricity, it, 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 can, it can harm you and kill you. Absolutely. Um, you, know, you know, electricity brings great blessing. Absolutely. I'm able to come to you through this means of media, electricity. Thank God for it. If the electric goes out here at my house, we, we can't shoot this. It's, thank God for electricity. But you know, if I stand in a bucket of water and stick myself in the lights, stick my finger in the light socket, it's not going to be a blessing. And you know, electricity is no respecter of persons. It'll, it, it, it'll, kill, it'll kill me, and I don't know that much about electricity. It'll kill an electrician, too, who knows a lot about electricity. You can't mishandle it. 
You can't mishandle it or it can kill you. Now, an electrician, you know, he knows not to, you know, knows better, knows not to mishandle electricity. You know, I know not to stand in a bucket of water and stick my finger in a light socket. You know, but the point is, if you mishandle electricity, as great a blessing as it's meant for, it can kill you and has killed people. Well, the anointing of God is meant to bless people, but if it's mishandled, it can kill people. If you, if you look at 2 Samuel 6, you can see, and you can read the story there, but the Ark of the Covenant, which we read about at the beginning of the uh, of this story, it was it represented the anointing of God, and it was to be handled uh, in a certain way, a prescribed way. And uh, and long story short, the Ark had been captured by the Philistines, and then it went into Abinadab's house. It was there for twenty years, and. And then, and then David wanted that ark back. And so he, he, he went to get the ark back and they had set the ark on a cart. Now, it's interesting, the Philistines had set the ark on a cart. Now, the, the ark had caused the Philistines a lot of problems. That's a whole story in and of itself. But they, they wanted to get rid of that ark because it was bringing them problems. The Philistines, unbelievers. And... Uh, Anyway, it winds up in Abinadab's house, and but but the Philistines had set it on a cart at one point, and, and and it's interesting they didn't drop down, they didn't fall dead, because they didn't know better. See, see, uh, electric electricity in the natural realm will kill you if you mishandle it. Period. But thank God, over here in the spiritual realm, the anointing God is merciful, and and the Philistines were ignorant of of of, of what the priests and the Levites knew. And so they, they were able to put the cart, uh, the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, not fall dead, the Philistines. But, but as time went on, that Ark wound up in Abinadab's house and then David wanted it back. And so they go to get it and then they set that Ark. Now, the people of God now, set, who should know better, they set that Ark upon a cart and they begin to bring it back to Jerusalem. And look at 2 Samuel 6. Verse 1, again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up the, from there the Ark of God, and uh, so on and so forth. So they set the Ark of God on a new cart, shouldn't have done that, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the cart. Now, these guys were priests, and they, they, they knew that you shouldn't be setting the ark on a cart, and they knew you shouldn't be touching it. You couldn't touch it. In verse 6, And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled, the angle, and the anger of the Lord. The oxen stumbled, the ark is about to fall. Uzzah puts out his hand to, to steady it, keep it from falling. The anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, for his error and he died there by the ark of God. See, the, the, the anointing is meant for a blessing, but if it's mishandled, and, and you see the Philistines mishandled it, 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 and they didn't fall dead. It brought them some trouble, but they didn't fall dead because they didn't know any better. Uh, now again, you mishandle electricity, no matter whether you know better or not, it's going to kill you. Over here in the spiritual realm, the mercy of God is great. And, and if you're ignorant of some things, God will wink at some ignorance like he did with the Philistines. But when the people of God set the ark on a cart, they knew better, should have known better. They should have known better. They obviously didn't, but they should have known better. <laughs> and, then, and then Uzzah was, you study into it, he knew, but he was a priest. He knew better. He was a Levite. He knew better. And he mishandled the anointing and he fell dead right side of that which was meant to be a blessing to him. You don't want to mishandle the power of God. You don't want to mishandle the power of God, and he knew better. And then after you could read on here, then after this happened, David was, he was, <laughs> I mean, he was frightened. He said, how can the ark come to me? And I, then I believe it went to Obed-Edom's house. There's a whole message in there. And then eventually, <laughs> you know, I'll put it in my own words, they went and got their, they got their scrolls out, they got their Bibles out, and they, they brushed up on how that ark was to be handled. And then they brought it back the right way to Jerusalem, and it was a great blessing. But you don't want to mishandle the anointing. I'm not trying to scare you, but you don't want to mishandle it. Uh, I remember back to Maria Woodworth Etter in her meetings, that lady that got froze there, you know, in that trance back in the early 1900s in St. Louis. I remember studying her life 
if I'm not mistaken, I remember that people sometimes would come out to her meetings and they'd begin to mock her. And, and, and the power of God would come on these mockers and, it would, and, and they'd fall dumb. In other words, they couldn't speak, they couldn't talk. It's a dangerous thing to mock the things of God, to make fun of the things of God. It's a dangerous thing to mock the, the, the anointing. Dangerous thing. I'm just telling you, it's a dangerous thing. And the anointing is meant for blessing, but it's a dangerous thing to mock it. Absolutely, it's a dangerous thing to mock the Holy Ghost and His power. Dangerous thing, dangerous thing. Say, so, well, yeah, but that, that issue with the ark there and Uzzah falling dead, that was the Old Testament, Pastor Terry. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to close in Acts, the fifth chapter in the New Testament where there was a man and a woman, husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira. And you can read it in Acts, the fifth chapter. For the sake of time, I'll just sum it up. They came into, the, into, into where Peter was. No doubt Peter was under the anointing. And you can read the story. I've run out of time, so I'll just tell you this. They lied to Peter when he was under the anointing. And, and it, it, it talks about lying to the Holy Spirit. Peter was under the anointing and they lied to the Holy Spirit. And these weren't baby Christians. I could teach you a message on why they weren't. They, they may well have been in leadership in the church. I can't prove that, but, but I could give you some reasons why I think that. But they, there's no question, they knew better. And they came in there and they lied to Peter while he was under the anointing. They lied. And the Bible says in Acts 5, uh, verse 3, Peter tells Ananias when he, when he told that lie. And actually it was a half truth. But remember, a half truth equals a whole lie. And it had to do with selling a piece of ground. And they made out like they were giving all the money to the church, but they kept back half of it, him, him and his wife, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. And they had a conspiracy there and they were trying to puff themselves up in front of the congregation. And you can read it, but the point is here, they came in and Ananias lied to Peter under the anointing. And in verse three, Peter says, he says, uh, he, that Ananias was lying to the Holy Spirit and he fell dead right there. I, I, what, what looks to me like in a church service. And then about three hours later, his wife comes in and, and actually, well, Peter says in verse four, tells Ananias, you've not lied to men, but to God. See, he lied to, he lied to the Holy Ghost. He lied to the anointing, if you will. And he fell dead. You don't want to mishandle the anointing. And then about three hours later, his wife comes in and verse nine, yeah, she fought, well, before she falls dead, Peter uh, uh, challenges her and says, why, why have you agreed together, you know, with your husband to test the spirit of the Lord, to test the anointing? Dangerous thing to do that. She falls dead. See the anointing and they took her, took her out and buried her. You know, the anointing is meant for a blessing, but you, you don't want to mishandle it. You don't want to speak ill of it. You don't want to mock it. You just don't want to take my word. Word to the wise should be sufficient. You don't want to do that. But the anointing is meant to bless you. Now, again, I normally don't share a lot of these stories, particularly these personal stories that I shared with you. But I did so because, as I said, the Lord wanted me to, to let you know, hey, that the, the anointing is real. Sometimes it's tangible. And, and, and I shared these stories, these personal stories with you to stir your faith and to let you know, hey, this, the anointing isn't just for the Old Testament or the new, the, you know, the, the early, the days of the early church, but it's, it's, it's flowing today and the anointing flows like electricity. The anointing flows and it'll flow right from me to you. Remember last week? We, we, we told you, you know, remember Peter told that, that beggar at the gate, he said, look on us, him and, him and John. He, he didn't, you know, not look at us, that, that beggar was, he needed to be healed. And Peter said, look on us, not look at us. Why look on? Because the anointing was on Peter and John and that man got healed because the man, he had to get his eyes off of Peter and John and get his eyes on the anointing. So I want to just encourage you, hey, the anointing is real. Don't look at me, look on me. Years ago when I was, I guess I was in my early 20s, I don't know, 22, 23, 
I, I was in a service and I was, uh, the preacher was preaching and I, and I, I said to the Lord, just nobody heard me. I said, Lord, I said, I'm not going to pray for the sick because that minister was up praying for the sick. And I said, I, this is what I said to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm not going to, just told this to the Lord. Nobody heard it. I said, Lord, I've never shared this before, this part of it. I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, I'm not going to lay hands on the sick until an anointing comes on me like it comes on David Crank Sr., that's what I said to the Lord. That's what I knew at the time. That's what I said. I no more said that than that minister. His name was Larry Willigie. He stopped dead still. He spun around, looked right at me. He said, Brother Terry, the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to me and said that there's a special anointing going to come on you to heal the sick and it's going to be by the multitudes. Wow. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, why do I share that? To let you know there's a special anointing on me to heal the sick. I'm nothing, but the anointing is everything. And the proof of the puddings in the eating, we've got 30 plus years of proof where multitudes have been healed, not by me, but by the anointing, that special anointing. So don't look at me. You look at me, you're going to be disappointed. But look on me. There's an anointing on me, the special anointing to heal the sick. I'm nothing but the anointing's everything. And that anointing flows. And I speak to you. Let that anointing flow into your body. Now, wherever it is that you need that anointing to flow in your body, put your hand, put your hand on. Go ahead. Put your hand on wherever that is on your body that you need the power of God to flow. Let that anointing, let that anointing flow. Don't look at me now. Well, I, well, I can't help you. Look on me. And put your hand wherever that is, on your head, on your back, on your, on your side, wherever it is, on your heart, wherever it is. Put your hand on your body, wherever it is that you need that anointing to flow to. Now look on me and I say in the name of the Lord Jesus, anointing, flow into those bodies. And anointing, go into those bodies and affect a healing and a cure. Drive out sickness, drive out disease if there's demonic power present. That demonic power has to go in and be healed. I command you to be healed in Jesus' name. Now let that anointing flow. And let it go into your body. Some people will be healed immediately. Some people that, that anointing will reside in your body and, and the healing and the, the cure will come in the process of time and you'll recover. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're out there and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, there's a heaven to gain, a hell to shun. The only way to miss hell and make heaven when you die is to repent of your sins and receive Jesus as your Savior. How do I do that? Call on his name. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So call on his name right now. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. And he will. You'll miss hell one day. You'll make heaven and he'll make your life worth living in the meantime. And let that anointing work in you and don't ever give up on it. Let it work. and It'll do its job. And you'll be glad you did in Jesus name. Now, I'll see you next week and we'll pick up with, I believe we'll talk about the anointing within. A great, great subject. We'll see you then. God bless you. Bye bye.